very pleased to be here in this grand uh, banking ballroom and to have the occasion to tell you a little bit about our research. So I'm going to focus today on the construct of executive function. It's a term that you may or may not heard of, have heard of, but uh, it's one of a number of overlapping constructs that are familiar, constructs like self-control, self-regulation, uh, effortful control, and the like. In particular, executive function comes from the neuropsychological tradition, and it emphasizes the uh, brain processes that make it possible and are involved in the top-down regulation of just about everything else the brain does. So the top-down regulation of uh, and goal-directed modulation of attention, thought, action, emotion, and the like. These are processes that are related to but different from what we normally mean by the term intelligence. In contrast to intelligence, executive function has more to do with being able to translate what you know into practice, being able to act on the basis of your knowledge. In adults, it's often discussed in terms of three facets. Cognitive flexibility, being able to think about one thing from multiple points of view, including, for example, taking somebody else's perspective. Uh, working memory, being able to keep information in mind, keep it activated so that you can use it in a kind of top-down, goal-directed fashion to guide your behavior. And inhibitory control, which refers to uh, the suppression of, for example, attention to distracting information or suppression of impulses or prepotent habitual responses. In fact, over the course of childhood, executive function appears to develop from a relatively undifferentiated construct into uh, eventually these three uh, somewhat separable aspects of executive function. This is an example of experience-dependent specialization of neural processes. And so you have something that looks like this over the course of childhood into adolescence. Uh, executive function is, is relevant to the discussion of empathy for uh, a number of reasons. Executive function is a kind of set of foundational skills that make it possible for children to learn in a more uh, planful and um, uh, attentive fashion. So it sets the stage for learning, for example, by giving children the possibility of sitting still and paying attention without distraction and the like. And similarly, it's a foundation for uh, the display of empathic behavior, perhaps not for the gut wrench of empathy initially, but whether or not uh, one allows that empathy into consciousness and keeps it in mind in a way that might support pro-social behavior on the basis of that empathy. And so the development and display of empathy, we might say, is supported by paying attention and resisting distraction, keeping relevant aspects of the context in mind, flexibly being able to consider somebody else's point of view, and to continue to consider somebody else's point of view despite the fact that being empathic is not always pleasant. And so one might have incentive to avoid uh, suffering in others. There's been a lot of interest in uh, the development of executive function in recent years for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that problems with executive function are very prominent characteristics of a number of disorders with onset in childhood, including conduct disorder, autism, ADHD, and others. Problems in executive function are linked to specific problem behaviors, such as high levels of uh, aggression, and it's become clear that executive function measured in childhood is an excellent predictor of important developmental outcomes. So it's closely linked to self and social understanding, studied under the rubrics of things like theory of mind and emotional intelligence. It's an excellent predictor of school readiness, uh, the transition to kindergarten, um, in some studies, it's been shown to be a better predictor than IQ, 
Uh, and in fact, if you ask teachers, what is it that children need in order to do well in your kindergarten classroom or during the early grades, teachers typically say that it's important that children be able to sit still and pay attention and follow rules and so forth. They don't say it's important that children come to kindergarten uh, with uh, early literacy skills, early math skills, and the like. If those foundations for learning in place, it's relatively easy to teach children the typical content of reading, writing, and arithmetic. Executive function measured in childhood predicts children's SAT scores in high school. It even predicts from preschool into middle age. And so here's a figure from a paper by Moffitt and colleagues during which, uh, in which um, they measured executive function uh, over the course of a number of years. They measured it in a number of ways in early childhood, and then they followed these children up. And when they were 32 years of age, they uh, looked at them again, and they found that executive function in childhood predicted physical health outcomes, the likelihood of having uh, drug-related problems. It predicted socioeconomic status, so educational and economic uh, achievement. And as shown in this figure, it was a strong predictor of the likelihood of having been convicted of a criminal offense by age 32 years. So you have childhood self-control in quintiles, the lowest over on the left, the highest over on the right. And there you have the percentage of individuals who uh, had an adult criminal conviction. And you can see that for those kids with the lowest levels of executive function in childhood, they were at very elevated risk of having difficulty with the law. And these relations held up even when you controlled for the socioeconomic status of the childhood environment and childhood IQ. But while there are stable individual differences, as seen in that uh, study, for example, um, executive function is clearly malleable, and that's going to be a focus of the second half of my talk. The first piece of evidence uh, speaking to that, of course, is that executive function develops over the course of childhood. What does that mean? That means that the brain adapts to the environmental pressures over the course of childhood uh, under typical circumstances. I just want to point out a few key principles that we um, like to keep in mind, principles drawn from uh, recent research on the developing brain. The brain is an inherently adaptive organ. That's what it evolved to do. It evolved to allow us to adapt to changing environments during the course of our lifetime. Second, most of the things that we think and feel and do, not just specific skills like skiing or playing tennis or something like that, can usefully be thought of as skills that depend upon the activation of specific neural circuits in the brain. And these neural circuits and the skills that they support are modifiable by experience. So I like to say that we grow our brains by using them. And we grow our brains in particular ways by using them in particular ways. And some of you might be familiar with this uh, famous study, for example, that appeared some years ago by Eleanor McGuire and colleagues. It was looking at taxi drivers in London and found uh, that those individuals who were taxi drivers um, had, in contrast to um, uh, other individuals the same age and from the same background, they had um, uh, different um, volumes or sizes, really, of uh, the relevant neural regions, in this case, hippocampus is really important for spatial navigation and spatial memory. And so there was actually a correlation as shown over on the right-hand panel here. The longer these individuals had been driving a taxi in London, the greater were these differences in the volume of hippocampus in, in, uh, in the brain. OK, so much of what we do uh, in everyday life, we can do pretty automatically. We can get by on autopilot for quite a few things. But the need for executive function is pervasive. We need executive function to control our attention in situations like this and avoid distractions, avoid, uh, for example, impulsive objections to what I say. 
we need it to be able to change our behavior. So whenever we decide we want to go on a diet or change our exercise routine, we're drawing upon whatever executive function skills we have. And the effort associated with changing your behavior is the subjective effort that goes along with the exercise of executive function skill. In short, we might say executive function is essential for problem solving. Whenever we solve a problem, we typically go through a series of steps. First, we represent the problem. We have some idea of where we are, where we'd like to be, what we might do to get from where we are to where we'd like to be. In light of that problem representation, we engage in some planning. We figure out, all right, here's my strategy. I'm going to try to solve the problem this way. We all know the best laid plans often go awry, and so it's not just enough to come up with a good plan. One actually has to keep that plan in mind and use it to guide your behavior in the moment. And then finally, uh, one typically evaluates. Have I solved the problem, or do I need to go back and maybe change my plan, come up with a new plan, or perhaps just try again to implement the same plan. And failures of executive function can occur at any one of these phases of problem solving. They typically result in some sort of inflexibility or rigidity. You get stuck on thinking about the problem in a particular way, perhaps, that isn't conducive to finding a solution. Or you get stuck on just trying to solve the problem in the same old way that you've tried in the past, even though it's not working. Uh, executive function refers to the processes at the cognitive level and then at the neurocognitive level that make problem solving possible. Just to give you another example uh, and to uh, highlight the, uh, the broad applicability of, um, of problem solving in our daily lives and perhaps in particular its relevance to uh, empathy related behavior. Imagine a possible provocation on the playground. You've got kids and somebody's playing a game and they, one child bumps into another child. You could imagine a child who responds aggressively to that potential provocation rather than verbally uh, asking, oh, you know, did you mean to do that or something? And you could uh, imagine, too, that that child who responds aggressively does so for a number of possible reasons. Maybe that child is in the habit of assuming that people are always out to get him or her, right? So the child might have uh, hostile attribution biases, for example, and might be stuck on thinking about situations through that lens, from that perspective. On the other hand, a child might uh, have difficulty anticipating the consequences. Well, he hit me, if I hit him back, then he's going to hit me again, and then we're both going to end up in the principal's office. It's not going to be good for anybody, right? Uh, it might be the case, too, that a child does anticipate those consequences, has been in this situation before, but simply can't resist that strong urge to retaliate with aggressive responding. And finally, it could be that you have a child who has been in this situation before and simply hasn't learned from those experiences, hasn't engaged in the kind of reflective evaluation that might make it possible for them to go back and change their uh, default assumptions or their general approach to the situation. So I mentioned executive function refers to the processes that make those phases of problem solving possible. And you can ask, for example, what's the role of working memory in planning? What's the role of working memory in keeping information in mind to guide your behavior and the like? Theories of executive function typically seek to explain executive function in terms of what's going on in the brain, in terms of basic uh, neurological function. <clears throat> it's long been known, in fact, that executive function depends importantly on the brain, uh, in particular, especially the front third of the brain, so-called prefrontal cortex, and the consequences of damage to this part of the brain have informed our understanding of executive function for some time. Some of you might be familiar with the famous case of Phineas Gage, who was working on a railroad uh, outside of Burlington, Vermont, and had a tamping iron, unfortunately, blown through the front part of his head, damaging prefrontal cortex. Remarkably, he survived. Even more remarkably, he recovered uh, his basic cognitive functions. 
but there were lingering impairments that in retrospect we now recognize as impairments in executive function. His attending physician described those changes uh, as changes in personality. He was described as now uh, post-accident as fitful, irreverent, devising many plans of future operations which are no sooner arranged than they're abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. Sounds a little bit like a distractible child, potentially, in a classroom. In fact, there's a syndrome associated with prefrontal cortical damage, sometimes called dis-executive syndrome, characterized by just that type of distractible hyperactivity. Also, cognitive inflexibility, rigidity, lack of self-awareness, including lack of insight into the fact that one has these difficulties, impulsivity, and something called environmental dependency that I'll give you another example of. The French neurologist Francois Lermite uh, noted that a number of his patients exhibited a kind of stimulus-driven behavior of the sort that we typically associate with young children. Uh, so for example, he had one patient who'd been a nurse prior to her injury, and he invited her into his office, and he uh, arranged some props on his desk, a blood pressure gauge and a tongue depressor and so forth, and she just proceeded as illustrated here, to pick them up and use them as she would have in her career as a nurse. So she responded in a relatively stimulus-driven way to the suggestions of those stimuli, of those props, and uh, did not particularly take into consideration the current context, the fact that she was the patient and he was the doctor. I want to switch now to uh, just a very brief summary overview of uh, the development of executive function across childhood. So as all of you, I'm sure, are aware, there are really dramatic changes in executive function that take place over the first uh, few years of life. Um, there is a transformation from a relatively stimulus-bound, present-oriented infant. Imagine a baby who's fussing, and you pull out your keys and shake them, and then all of a sudden the baby orients to the keys, and is fixating on them, right, completely out of that uh, fussy mood. By the time you get to uh, the toddler ages, around two years of age or so, children might be less likely to give up uh, an attitude of frustration, so to speak. You can imagine, for example, a child at the uh, checkout aisle at a store decides that she wants something and throws a fit, and it's not that easy, necessarily, to talk her out of it. By the time the child's a preschooler, you can perhaps say, well, you know, you can't have that, but if you wait till you get home, then we can do something else that'll be really fun, and you might be able to get a child uh, to change their behavior on the basis of that anticipation of some future event. So you have children who are much better able, for example, to think about the future, plan a birthday or whatever, also to take somebody else's point of view, and so forth. But of course, the development of all these skills, planning, adaptive decision making, et cetera, is a slow process and it continues into adolescence and indeed beyond. Let me give you an example of a measure of executive function that uh, is uh, often used um, to assess executive function in childhood and indeed beyond, as I'll show you. Uh, this is a measure that we developed some years ago called the dimensional change card sort, and in one version of it, with actual cards, uh, children are shown target cards like those, and then on every test trial, they're shown a test card that would be sorted differently whether you were sorting by shape or by color. And they're first told to sort one way, for example, by shape, so they're told, if it's a car, put it here, but flowers go there, look, here's a flower, where does this go? And then after a certain number of trials, they're told, okay, we're not gonna play the shape game anymore. We're gonna play a new game. It's a color game. Red ones go here, blue ones go there. Look, here's a red one. Where does this go? And in fact, uh, we have um, a number of different levels of uh, complexity um, of, of the rules that are required for sorting uh, successfully. And so it's possible to use this measure across a relatively wide range of ages we, these days, typically don't do it with actual cards. We do it on a computer. We've created uh, an iPad app that allows us um, to uh, 
to administer this, this task in a kind of computer adaptive way so it relatively quickly settles in on the appropriate level of difficulty and then finds out how uh, challenging um, a version of this can children succeed at. Um, <clears throat> and so typically uh, in the version that I showed you um, with the, the girl um, sitting before the actual cards, children typically at age three have no difficulty sorting by that initial dimension. So in that example we said uh, sort by shape and a typical three-year-old would do that just fine and then you'd say all right now stop sorting by shape we're going to switch and sort by color and a typically developing three-year-old would have difficulty with this they would continue to sort by shape despite being told to sort by color on every trial and despite demonstrating some knowledge of the new color rules if you look at uh, performance on this measure across early childhood you see there are really rapid gains uh, that take place. By about four years of age, most children uh, on the version that I just showed you switch flexibly. Like adults, they seem to know immediately when they see these stimuli that they know two different ways of playing the game, and so they're uh, paying attention to the cues that indicate which way I'm supposed to play on any particular trial. In other words, they seem spontaneously to stop before responding and step back and reflect on their own knowledge and how it relates to the situation. We can think about that in terms of uh, these, this abstract kind of formulation here. It's as if three-year-olds can consciously get their mind around a pair of rules like if it's a car it goes here, if it's a flower it goes there. You introduce the new rules, red ones here, blue ones there, they can get their minds around that too. But what they have difficulty doing is stepping back and considering those two pieces of knowledge, those two pairs of rules, in relation to one another. And in the absence of a kind of higher order rule supported by reflective processing for selecting among the rules that one has, uh, what you see is performance being determined in a more stimulus-driven or bottom-up fashion. The child instead responds to uh, the suggestions in the environment. So, oh, I, I've seen these before and this is what I did last time and, th and that's what results in uh, perseverative responding. We can say reflection changes one's perspective. It provides a kind of psychological distance analogous to actual physical distance uh, and <clears throat> that um, gives uh, a person who is reflecting a more panoramic view that allows them to see the range of possible options at their disposal and it allows them to select among those possible options. But of course reflection is effortful uh, as I mentioned earlier and it continues to develop into childhood. We've had an opportunity recently to look at the development of executive function and also in particular the development of performance on this measure across the lifespan as part of the uh, National Institutes of Health Toolbox Project that Lisa mentioned. Uh, the Toolbox Project was intended to develop a set of standardized uh, and well-validated and psychometrically sound measures that could be used to assess cognitive, emotional, sensory, and motor health and function across the lifespan. So they had to be brief yet comprehensive, uh, available in English and Spanish, uh, the kind of measure that you can administer repeatedly to the same individual so that you can uh, track progress over time, look at the effects of various interventions and so forth. And as you can imagine, it was uh, no small task to come up with a single measure that could meet all of these criteria. Uh, in addition to the dimensional change card sort that I told you about, another measure of executive function included in this toolbox battery is uh, taken from a, a task uh, that's been in the literature for some time and, and this particular version um, was created by Charo Rueda and uh, Michael Posner and colleagues. It's called a flanker task and children are shown a row of stimuli like these 
and they're instructed to indicate the left-right orientation of just the middle stimulus, in this case a fish. So you're told, these children are told, feed the fish, and you have to press this button to feed the fish if it's pointing this way, this button if it's pointing that way. The challenge, of course, is that you have these distracting stimuli that are flanking the central stimulus, and you have to suppress your attention to those interfering, distracting stimuli, which would lead you to respond incorrectly. And so if you look at performance on both uh, of these measures, the dimensional change card sort and the flanker task, they show very much the same thing. There are rapid improvements, as I suggested, during early childhood, but performance continues to improve beyond that. In fact, reaching a peak in young adulthood, as is characteristic of many measures of this sort, uh, and then beginning a rather precipitous decline, unfortunately. This is uh, a, a large sample based on um, the general population in the United States, and so it may well include uh, individuals with undiagnosed uh, age-related uh, diseases and the like, and, and uh, as we'll discuss in the balance of this presentation, um, where you end up in adulthood on this type of figure really depends on what you're doing. Uh, whether you're continuing to exercise your executive function skills uh, during your adult life or not. So, so those of us in this room don't have to be <laughs> quite so dismayed uh, by, by those data. In general, this pattern of the rise and fall of executive function uh, across the lifespan fits with what we know about the development of prefrontal cortex. Often people refer to last in, first out. So it's very slow to develop, and it's uh, a very part of a very complex network and set of networks and relatively vulnerable to disruption. What this figure shows is from ages 5 to 20, those areas that are still in green in the rightmost panel there have not yet reached that young adult level of uh, quote-unquote maturity by, by some indices. Uh, in fact, if you look at performance on the dimensional change card sort and you measure um, oxygenated hemoglobin, basically blood flow, uh, in prefrontal cortex um, through a technique, uh, I won't go into the details, but what you see is that during this task, when you're, when you're shown a test card, and so now you face the challenge, do I sort it by shape or do I sort it by color? In those children who succeed, who do well, you see an increase in blood flow to prefrontal cortex. In those children who perform poorly, typically younger children, you actually see a decrease, presumably because blood is flowing to other parts of the brain. Uh, you see something similar in adolescents and in young adults. This is research by uh, my colleague Bruce Morton at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, when performing, slightly more challenging versions of this task where you switch, for example, back and forth unpredictably, you're cued to do it, but uh, you see activation in lateral prefrontal cortex, that same uh, front part of the brain that I was referring to before. I'm gonna give you just a little bit of background about how we think about what's going on in the brain and in the mind. Um, uh, when um, engaging in executive function. Our account, um, and uh, the most recent version of this developed with my colleague Will Cunningham at the University of Toronto now, uh, is an account of the development of executive function that emphasizes the reflective reprocessing of information in prefrontal cortex. So it's uh, an account that emphasizes that business of stopping and stepping back and reflecting on what you're doing. It can be very quick, but still has to happen. Rather than just responding directly to the situation, rather than jumping right in impulsively, there has to be some effort uh, at putting everything into a broader context. So reflection on rules allows for the formulation of more complex characterizations of the situation. For example, in the dimensional change card sort, it allows children to say to themselves, oh, I get it. If we're sorting by color, then I put that red flower over here. But if we're sorting by shape, that same red flower then goes over there, right? So you've taken these two 
pieces of knowledge that you have and you've coordinated them, you've integrated them into a single uh, system of, of rules. So to say a little bit more about reflective reprocessing, instead of responding directly to the most salient aspects of a situation on the basis of an initial gloss of the situation as it presents itself, you could say responding on the basis of a relatively minimal level of consciousness. Instead, uh, information is fed back into the system and coordinated with other information uh, that the child has. And this allows uh, for um, a more complex characterization of the situation. It also allows for information to be decoupled from online moment by moment processing and kept in information so that kept in mind, maintained in working memory, so that it can be used in this kind of top down way to guide responding. So in contrast to the common sense notion then that one is either conscious or not conscious of something, the idea here is that there are levels of consciousness. We can be conscious of something at one level but not at another. For example, like that girl who's conscious of the new rules, I mean, you ask her an explicit question about it and she'll tell you even verbally uh, an answer. But there's a sense in which she's not aware of how what she knows relates to other things that she knows and how what she knows relates to the current situation. Each degree of reprocessing or each level of consciousness, each step that one might take in the process of reflection has consequences for the quality of subjective experience because it allows more information to be integrated into your, in short, perception of a situation before you move on to the next uh, moment. It has uh, implications for recollection. So some of you might be familiar with the work of Craik and Lockhart on levels of processing and the consequences of that, of deeper processing leading to uh, better memory down the line. In terms of this framework, that would be a specific instance of reflection and uh, an increase in levels of consciousness. But most directly relevant to uh, goal-directed behavior of the sort that I'm going to continue to discuss is the implication for the complexity of children's knowledge structures, which I've already described, right? So as you step back and reflect further on what you know, you're able to create a more complex characterization of the situation. For example, a set of rules like if you're playing by color, then if it's a red flower, it goes here. And that allows you to be more flexible and control your behavior across a wider range of situations. Uh, this account also uh, acknowledges that um, these top-down influences on behavior continually interact with bottom-up influences on behavior, things like your emotional reactions, stress, and the like, uh, and the influence of bottom-up influences on your behavior might be more uh, pronounced when emotional arousal is high, and this leads to a distinction that we make between uh, what we call cool executive function and hot executive function. And I don't want to go too much into the detail, but it turns out slightly different parts of the brain are involved in solving problems in motivationally significant situations and relatively abstract, decontextualized situations like the dimensional change card sort. I mean, who really cares about shapes and colors and what goes here? It's all arbitrary, right? But typically, when we solve problems in the real world, we do so because we really care about the outcome. The stakes are higher. And so you also have to manage your emotional uh, reactions, your stress level, your anxiety, what if I fail, all these kinds of things. And that tends to draw upon um, nearby, but uh, somewhat different parts of prefrontal cortex, um, ventral and more, I don't have a pointer, I don't think, on this. but. Um, more ventral and medial, um, so lower and uh, in, inside the brain, rather than those lateral parts of prefrontal cortex that we typically associate with executive function because we typically forget about hot executive function and assume uh, that executive function only refers to cool executive function. 
The idea is, uh, of this distinction is that similar uh, regulatory processes are operative, so you can still talk about cognitive flexibility and working memory and inhibitory control, but they're operating on different informational inputs. There's more input from uh, those parts of the brain that are involved in uh, emotional reactions and so forth. And another way to think about it, closely related, is that hot and cool executive function vary in how symbolically mediated the processing is, or how abstracted away from uh, an important approach avoid decision uh, the considerations are. And so here's an example of um, a measure of hot executive function, the famous marshmallow test, I'm sure you've heard of, uh, pioneering work by Walter Michel and his colleagues. In one version of this, children are, are given a choice. You can have, for example, one candy now, or if you wait till it's time to go home, you can have three candies. Which do you prefer? And young children, as is well known, are often uh, notoriously um, inclined to, to choose the immediate reward, right? They fail to delay gratification, as it's, as it's called. And so uh, I'll just tell you very briefly about one study here that illustrates, I think, the distinction between hot and cool executive function within the context of this very task. Um, Angela Principe and I, um, some years ago, uh, gave children a series of uh, such choices. In fact, there were nine trials. So would you like one now or six later? And sometimes it was M&Ms or something, and sometimes it was pennies or stickers. And uh, we had three and four-year-old children, and they were randomly assigned either to get <clears throat> that task, just as I described it, or a different, slightly different task, where the experimenter said after showing the child what the game was all about, OK, you know what? Now it's my turn. I get to choose. I can have one candy now or two candies later. What should I do? And what we found is that young children, three-year-olds, uh, typically gave what we would call good advice to the experimenter. They said, you should wait. Take the larger reward. But those children in the other condition said, no, I want it now. So they delayed gratification on behalf of the examiner. Presumably, that's a relatively cool decision, right? It's, one doesn't have to wrestle with one's own desire for immediate gratification in that case. By age four years of age, there was uh, no significant difference between these two conditions, suggesting uh, an increase in empathy, among other things, right? So uh, young children are starting to realize that, oh, this is a dilemma even for the other individual. There's some conflict between uh, the desire for immediate gratification and the desire for a larger reward. Uh, one way further to think about this is as you engage in reflection, you start drawing upon increasingly anterior frontal parts of the brain, uh, frontal parts of prefrontal cortex. Uh, prefrontal cortex, like the rest of the brain, is organized hierarchically. Um, and <clears throat> uh, initially, um, those stimulus reward um, uh, associations are activated that control um, whether to approach a situation or avoid a situation, but those can be contextualized, as I've suggested, by engaging in processes of reflection and considering that approach avoid decision relative to a larger context. Uh, so, of course, however, I've been talking about prefrontal cortex, uh, but it's not the case usually that one particular part of the brain is involved in one particular type of behavior. The brain is, is highly networked and interactive. And so executive function also depends on the integrity of other parts of the brain. Uh, in fact, it interacts in an important way with a region called anterior cingulate cortex that's involved in conflict detection, noticing whether or not there's a problem here to be solved. Is there some uncertainty or error or conflict that might uh, <clears throat> prompt me to engage in reflective reprocessing and try to solve this problem in a more deliberate, top-down fashion, as opposed to just acting on the basis of what I've done before. And so you have something like this. I'll show you over the course of a few slides. You have 
uh, you have a kind of warning signal that says we have a problem and that triggers the activation of these increasingly frontal parts of the brain that support the reflective reprocessing of information. Uh, and then, of course, the consequences of reflection feed back and influence uh, other parts of the brain. So, for example, once you reflect on the problem and you say, oh, I get it, you know, in the color game we do this, shape game we do that, then you don't have that kind of warning signal saying there's conflict here, there's unresolved problems to be solved. And so in the case of the dimensional change card sort, I've told you about um, the role of reflection, and indeed it is the case that uh, children, for example, who can articulate the perspective I described, that higher order perspective, who can tell you if we're playing color, red flower goes here, those are the kids who tend to switch flexibly, but some uh, work looking at children's neural activity in the context of this task also uh, reveals a role for conflict detection. So um, I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, we measured scalp electrical activity and we were particularly interested in a, um, in a, a, a deflection in um, the event-related potential, if you average uh, scalp electrical activity over a number of trials and you anchor it uh, to a stimulus, you can see there are these reliable patterns of activation. And the amplitude of a particular dip in that event-related potential is uh, indicative of the activation of uh, this part of the brain anterior cingulate cortex, which plays such a an important role in conflict detection, conflict monitoring, and the like. And so here you have children who are given the dimensional change card sort, and we split up the kids into those who failed and those who passed, and we administered the task in a way when we were recording their brain uh, scalp electrical activity, and what we found is those kids who passed showed lower amplitude uh, ERP components, the N2 component, suggesting that they had resolved the conflict and, and it wasn't such a problem for them. So, so these kids who were able to reflect, put it into perspective, they shut down that error signal that would normally be a trigger to uh, reflection. Okay, so I just want to, uh, before I um, get too deeply into intervention, more broadly, I want to say that this approach leads to the prediction that if you were able to create contexts that were conducive to reflection, you ought to be able to improve executive function performance and cognitive flexibility performance in particular. And so one way of doing that is through uh, language, and in particular through labeling the stimuli. So there are a number of reasons to think language is important in executive function, but if you look at the bottom here, if you label your initial perspective on the situation, like if you say, oh, you're thinking about it in terms of shape, then in order to do that, you have to step outside of that perspective, right? The perspective becomes something you're describing. So you say, that's looking at it in terms of shape. It's a little bit like if I take my glasses off and I say, oh, those affect my vision of the situation, right? Then it's relatively easy to consider alternative ways of viewing a situation, right? I can, I can easily imagine what it looks like to be blurry, right, if I take my glasses off. And so labeling does something of the same thing. By labeling your interpretation of a situation, you're stepping outside of it, it should put you into a perspective uh, that allows you to find an alternative way of looking at the situation with predicted consequences in flexibility and control. And uh, Sophie Jacques, who's now at Dalhousie University in Halifax, um, and I uh, conducted a series of studies with a measure that she developed called the Flexible Item Selection Task, based on a measure in the neuropsychological literature called the Visual Verbal Test. Children are shown stimuli like these, and they're told, show me two that go together. And uh, <clears throat> Even young children, say four-year-old children, are quite adept at doing that. They can point to these two, 
And, uh, and then you say, okay, show me two that go together, but in a different way. And here's where it gets challenging. Young children, even four-year-olds, have difficulty on this second selection. Once they've decided that, that the stimulus in the middle is a big one, and so goes with the shoe, right, they appear to have difficulty thinking about it in a different way, thinking of it as a teapot in this example. So that middle stimulus needs to be redescribed flexibly. And, uh, and so here's what you typically find with four and five-year-olds. And what Sophie was interested in doing is examining what's the effect of asking children to label their initial selection. So asking children to describe a perspective on the situation should put them at that vantage point that allows them to see alternative ways of construing the same situation. And so the question was, would labeling the basis for selection one improve performance on selection two? Notice if you label the basis of selection one, if you say, I chose that one, why did you choose that one? Because they're both big. You might think, well, that, if anything, is going to reinforce the child's commitment to thinking about the thing as a big thing. Maybe that would make it even harder for them to reframe it and think about it as a teapot. But uh, we predicted the opposite on the basis of this uh, way of thinking about executive function. So show me two pictures that go together one way. Why do these two pictures go together? Very simple manipulation. We had various control conditions. Um, and what we found is that just asking them to label their initial perspective made it easier for them to adopt an alternative perspective. There's uh, <clears throat> actually a series of studies corroborating that finding. OK, so relevant labels appear to help children to reflect on their cognitive processes, allowing for more complex construals of a particular situation. Uh, again, relevant to cognitive flexibility, potentially relevant to empathy. You know, I feel this way about the situation, but I can step outside of that perspective and consider somebody else's uh, perspective on the situation. So a lot of efforts to improve executive function in childhood have focused on uh, early childhood and, and the preschool period in particular. There are also economic reasons uh, to intervene early relative to late. This is a figure from uh, an article by Jim Heckman, uh, other work by Steve Barnett and, and many other economists who've looked at what's the return on investment for every dollar spent on childhood uh, education if you intervene early versus later. And you can measure the, uh, the cost in terms of things like child care and um, you know, cost to the social welfare system, the justice system, et cetera. And there's a much higher return on your investment. So for every dollar spent, you're getting seven or sometimes People estimate as many as, as high as 14 times a return on your investment for every dollar spent if it's spent early in childhood rather than relatively later in childhood on things like job training. Not to say that those aren't important too, but you uh, have the potential of a bigger impact the earlier you intervene for a number of uh, reasons, both reasons pertaining to the way in which the brain develops reasons pertaining to the way in which we structure our society, sending kids to kindergarten at age six and all of a sudden expecting that they have these basic skills of being able to sit still and pay attention and so forth, and also these economic reasons. Um, there have been a lot of programs recently uh, that have been addressing executive function, things like the Tools of the Mind curriculum. It's a broad, year-long preschool curriculum. There's the PATHS program developed by Mark Greenberg and colleagues, the Chicago School Readiness Project. There have also been uh, a number of studies bringing children into the laboratory and doing intensive training, sometimes on computer video games and that sort of thing, practicing over and over again uh, fundamental executive function skills. And uh, I'll say we now uh, are in some position to look across these interventions and say, what is it that effective interventions have in common? They tend to engage children in motivated, goal-directed activity. That's probably a prerequisite for any effective intervention whatsoever, but it's especially important if the intervention is directed at executive function because that's the context in which executive function is needed. 
when you're motivated to achieve a particular goal and solve the problem of obtaining that goal. They all tend to require reflection in one way or another. That is, they encourage children to get in the habit of stopping and considering before they dive right in and respond. They also tend continually to challenge children's developing skills. So as soon as children reach a certain level of proficiency, you have to be prepared to give them uh, a more challenging version, for example, of the same task or a different task. And, of course, they tend to involve lots and lots of practice. That's how you develop skills, whether the skill is playing tennis, skiing, reading, writing, or uh, engaging in reflection prior to uh, attempting to solve a problem. So we, um, I'll tell you just briefly about some studies we've done. Uh, these are studies, laboratory-based studies initially, bringing children into the lab, giving them practice, stepping back, reflecting, formulating a kind of higher order rule like I described earlier. So we bring kids in and those kids who uh, have difficulty on the dimensional change card sort, who, per who perseverate or persist in sorting by that initial dimension like the girl in the video that I showed you, and we play this game with them again, but we give them feedback and we model the reflective reprocessing that we think is so instrumental in performing successfully. So we say things like, oops, when you saw the red one, you pressed the button with red on it. That means you looked at the color, but now we're playing the shape game, and, and so on. We just talk it through and help them put this uh, situation into perspective, into a broader context. What we found across three different experiments uh, with different children in each experiment is that children, all of whom failed in the first place after this type of intervention, in one study it was a very brief 20-minute session, we found that half of them uh, or more uh, showed successful performance now after this uh, training in reflection, in what you need to do before you dive in and try to solve this problem. We found that performance uh, improved also on other measures, including, for example, a measure of theory of mind, in which we asked children um, about an ambiguous um, container, so for maybe it was like a Crayola crayon box, and children say, crayons, and then you open it up, it's got something else in it, like sticks, they say sticks, they're surprised. You close it up, you say, when you first saw this, before you looked inside, what did you think was in it? Three-year-olds tend to say, sticks. Then you say, your friend comes in and looks at this just from the outside, they don't open it up, what are they gonna think is in it? They say, sticks. So they found out the box has sticks in it, right? And that's the only way they think about it, relatively rigidly, and so training uh, reflection in the context of the dimensional change card sort increased the likelihood that they would say, oh, he's going to think there are crayons in it. We also looked at children's neural activity in the way that I showed you before, and we found that not only did children's behavior improve, but, as you might expect, we also saw, <coughs> excuse me, saw changes in their neural activity <coughs> that made the trained children look more like older children or children who were spontaneously successful. So even a brief intervention aimed at teaching children to reflect and formulate higher order rules led to improvement. Improvement was also seen in flexible perspective taking and other measures of executive function and in neural activity. <coughs> And I, I put this in here <coughs> just to underscore that um, there's a lot of research on uh, interventions targeting executive function, not only with young children, but also uh, across the lifespan. This is some work from uh, Adam Ghazali's lab at uh, University of California, San Francisco, in which they used a video game um, that required multitasking to train uh, to train uh, older adults and they found uh, considerable improvements in um, performance as a function of training. Okay, so who can benefit? Anyone, but there are reasons to focus on the young. Also, perhaps children who are at risk for difficulties with executive function. So we've been doing some work um, with homeless and highly mobile children in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, 
These are kids who are at the low end, you might say, of a continuum of poverty. It's actually a very high percentage of children in the uh, Minneapolis Public School District, about 10%, really remarkably sad. Um, these children are exposed to prolonged, what's sometimes called toxic stress. And because of the challenges that their parents and they face, they may be missing those, well, they may be missing structure and predictability in their lives, which is probably in itself important for being able to plan and, and solve future-oriented problems, but also they may be missing those kinds of teaching moments that children growing up under more uh, advantageous circumstances uh, tend to get, where, for example, your mother uh, might say, no, you can't have this, but if you wait and you get home, you know, th those are the moments in which you learn to practice, to exercise your developing executive function skills. So um, here's some data from my colleague Ann Maston at Minnesota, and uh, again, I don't have a pointer, but what you see is there's a continuum of poverty. The solid line is the, um, the national norm, and the rest of the lines are data from uh, Minneapolis schools, and what you see is the homeless and highly mobile kids are at the very bottom of that continuum. So they're at real risk, not just for problems with executive function, but of course problems in academic achievement. This is reading achievement. You could see the same thing if I were showing you math scores across, in this case, grades from three to eight. But one thing that that masks is there's considerable individual variability. Not all children who are homeless have difficulty with executive function, and not all children who are homeless have difficulty in school. And in fact, if you divide these children up into those who are so-called resilient, who do well despite facing these severe risk circumstances, those children, in contrast to the others, so these are all homeless children, the ones who are categorized as resilient have high levels of executive function. The ones who aren't have low levels of executive function. So we've been working in the context of a shelter in downtown Minneapolis to create a program to, to provide children with um, opportunities to exercise and practice these skills of reflection and executive function. There's a small, uh, the basic structure is to do um, this in small groups and to uh, practice executive function skills in the context of engaging games like Simon Says. For example, you all know Simon Says, right? And Simon Says, touch your head, and you touch your head, touch your nose, and you're not supposed to because Simon didn't say it. And we start out with a relatively easy version where there's all kinds of reminders and support and so forth and, and work kids up until they're really good at it, and then they can, in fact, do even the hardest versions of this. And we have a whole series of such exercises uh, that we administer to these kids during a brief window of access that we have to these homeless kids. You might wonder, how do you even get access to these kids because they're homeless and you can't call them up and invite them into the laboratory and so forth. And so uh, this homeless shelter, People Serving People in the Twin Cities, has generously allowed us to create an embedded lab on site. And they have a preschool on site. And the typical stay at this homeless shelter is about 40 days. And so we have, and, and the preschoolers tend to enroll in the on-site preschool. And so we have a kind of window of opportunity, three, three weeks we figured, during which we could uh, really try to give these kids a boost in executive function before they go off to kindergarten. There are other aspects to it. Parents, of course, um, are an important part of this whole intervention. And as parents are perhaps the thing that's going to be constant in these kids' lives as they move, um, it's really important to get them on board. And so we, we, we teach them how to continue to support uh, the development of executive function skills. So I would say, uh, and, and we have been saying on the basis of this kind of research, that executive function and indeed empathy ought to be part of the standard uh, curriculum in early childhood. They're not only just as important as reading and writing and arithmetic, in some sense they're far more important because they are the foundation that make those other things possible uh, to acquire and eventually to put to good use. Uh, we also argue you might as well invest early, but it's never too late. And, and one thing that's become really clear in the context of the work with the homeless kids is you also have to address these bottom-up influences that I mentioned earlier, in particular stress. 
The kids in this homeless shelter are very stressed, as you might imagine, and that makes it difficult for many of them even to participate in, in the intervention, right? So they're so stressed that it's hard to get them to just, you know, put the other stuff aside for a moment and pay attention to what you're trying to teach them. John Kabat-Zinn, a real pioneer in bringing mindfulness uh, practices into a Western, for example, medical context, says mindfulness means ma paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. And we've argued that it's really a kind of ideal intervention, especially for kids in difficult circumstances, because it simultaneously targets both these top-down skills, like sustaining attention for longer and longer periods of time, and it also addresses um, the regulation of uh, these bottom-up processes that might interfere with um, top-down regulation. So reducing stress, there's a whole story to be told there, increasing um, openness and curiosity, that non-judgmental attitude, noticing that, oh, I'm afraid now, but I don't necessarily have to act on the basis of that, right? Creates uh, conditions that are conducive to reflection and to um, executive function. And I'm going to skip over this. We did some work with uh, adults in which we trained um, mindfulness meditation over the course of seven weeks, and we presented them with um, emotional pictures, including negative pictures. And while the pictures were visible to the participants, this was with adults, they were told, you're going to hear a tone, and I just want you to tell me as quickly as possible, is it high-pitched or low-pitched, right? So press this button if it's high-pitched, that button if it's low-pitched, and forget about the picture. And so uh, what we expected is that mindfulness meditation ought to make it easier for participants to disengage from the otherwise obligatory capture by these negative pictures and instead pay attention to the task at hand and categorize the pictures relative to the tones relatively quickly. In fact, that's what we found. They, uh, in contrast to an active control condition and a no treatment control, um, and this was a randomized controlled trial with blind observers and all that, uh, the mindfulness group responded more quickly to the tones. <clears throat> Evidently, they disengaged from uh, automatic continued processing of the negative pictures, paid attention to the task at hand. They showed other kinds of changes that were consistent with that. And I'll leave you just with some very brief examples of how we've been adapting that kind of mindfulness um, practice for use with young children in a preschool context. And um, we do this over the course of um, about five weeks, twice a week, 20 minutes at a time. Of course, everything is, um, is, uh, is child-friendly and oriented towards um, their uh, uh, still um, nascent uh, skills at sustaining attention and introspecting and so forth. All of the practices emphasize calming down, reflecting on subjective experience. How do you actually feel right now? That kind of thing. Sustaining reflective attention over time and also empathy. Uh, so we have children do breathing <coughs> with a stuffed animal on the belly, rock it to sleep so that they pay attention to their breathing for longer and longer and it might be just five seconds to begin with, and then you try to get them to do it for six seconds, and then seven seconds, and so on. You start where they are, and you work your way up. You ring a bell, and everybody's quiet. They listen to it fade. They're told to raise their hand when they can't hear it anymore. Some kids raise their hand earlier than, other, earlier than others. There's an opportunity for uh, perspective-taking discussion around that. They do a body scan with a hula hoop. You feel, how do your knees feel right now? Can you pay attention to your knees and so forth? Um, friendly wishes to other children in the classroom and various other kinds of things. And what we found is improvements in uh, attention, sustained and selective attention, also improvements in theory of mind, perspective taking, and um, there's ongoing work, um, but the effects are certainly promising. There are a number of laboratories across North America and across the world that are uh, focusing on this now. A lot of interesting work coming out of Richie Davidson's lab uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'll leave you with this summary. Executive function is a foundation for empathy and certainly for empathic behavior.
uh, it's malleable, perhaps especially during the preschool period. In general, we grow our brains in particular ways by using them in particular ways. When you activate particular neural circuits over and over again, there are these changes that take place. Synaptic pruning, experience-dependent myelination, et cetera, that make those pathways more efficient and more robust and more likely to be activated in the future. Reflection training in particular has been shown to lead to improvements in executive function and corresponding uh, changes in neural activity. Mindfulness training also appears to be effective and for the reasons that I've discussed, especially if you think back to those longitudinal correlations from early childhood into adulthood, the consequences are potentially very far-reaching. And I'll end with that. Thank you very much.